Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm talking episode 13 of season 2 of Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. called One of Us. And overall I thought this was a reasonably solid episode. Not the most exciting one around, but you know, it, it gets the job done. Uh, so let's just kind of get right into things and start talking about what's going on with the characters. Uh, first of all, we get to finally meet Bay's ex-husband, and uh, he's turns out to be a pretty cool dude. And it was certainly interesting to see this side of May, where she's, you know, laughing and just sort of kidding around, and genuinely a, a pretty happy person. And it was pretty hilarious to notice that uh, the other people around her, like particularly Spitz and Simmons, were seriously weirded out by this. It just goes to really show you just how much of May's hard-ass side she's made a point of showing. But again, this does a really nice job of adding some depth to her character, rounding her out, and reminding us that you know May wasn't always this sort of robotic, hard-ass person who really pushed people away most of the time. As Colson said, she became that way after uh, some incident, which we never really learned the details of. <clears throat> In fact, in the early episodes, he even compared her to Skye in the early days. And this is doubtlessly one of the reasons why May feels such a close kinship to Skye. She sees Skye as being a younger version of herself and wants to spare her some of the pain that she went through. Uh, now, uh, May's husband, whose name I've already forgotten, uh, now he's a pretty well done character in himself. You know, he's, he bounces off May very well, and he sees through Skye's um, little tricks. Uh, to sort of distract him I mean like that but of course he's an experienced psychiatrist so of course he's going to know how to do that uh, it's a little disappointing they couldn't have maybe made this character into Leonard Sampson uh, who's basically sort of the best known good guy psych psychiatrist in the Marvel Universe but I suppose that might have been asking for just a little bit too much and, you know, I guess maybe they haven't won Marvel hasn't made up its mind 100% about doing another Hulk movie. Who knows? Uh, but in any case, uh, he was really well done. Um, well, let's um, move on to Sky since we brought her up. Now, here we see, see that she is beginning to get her powers under control to somewhat, to a somewhat, some, ugh, to some degree, but it's not there yet. And, of course, we also discover that she can turn her powers inward on herself at the price of damaging her body and this results in her getting those um, crazy casts which are more than a little reminiscent of the gauntlets that Daisy Johnson used to help uses to help control her powers in the comics of course Daisy Johnson being Skye's counterpart in the comic book universe so I have a feeling that it's only a matter of time before Fitz uh, sits down and works out some way to um, make some gauntlets that, are, that will help Sky control her powers, and Sky will, of course, continue to progress along that road so that she can do this herself. So the gauntlets might not be so much there to help her control her powers as to help enhance them, or perhaps direct them better. <clears throat> um, but yeah, apart from that, not a huge amount else to say about Sky. Um, speaking of Fitz, I, I definitely did like that he and Simmons are at least able to have a conversation with each other, like real people. And of course, this is them just sort of WTFing about May. Um, but again, it's nice to sort of see them just being able to talk to each other a little bit. Uh, not a huge amount to say about Simmons in particular this episode. I did notice, though, that she was still awfully quick to jump to the idea of sedate Sky if she um, seems to be having even the slightest problem, which really to me says that uh, Simmons is still has a long way to go on the whole see people with powers as people first rather than potential threats. But I'll consider that to be a little bit of progress. And um, let's see, who else do we have to talk about? Ah, yes, uh, poor Hunter being uh, locked up in the, that bathroom, being held prisoner by Mac. Uh, damn, Mac, couldn't you have got, given like a, the guy a book or something? Hunter must have been horribly bored just being chained to uh, a sink there. Um, uh, presumably he's within um, easy reach of a toilet there. 
And then he, we finally find out who uh, Mac and Bobby are working for. And this is, as they say, or at least as Mac says, the real shield. Now, we're going to be getting some details about that next episode. And from what I've heard, the, the quote-unquote real shield may be playing a rather significant part in Captain America 3, though I don't think that's been confirmed yet. Uh, in any case, this does sort of go with the theory that this is basically a splinter group of S.H.I.E.L.D. who have a different agenda and, again, view themselves as the real S.H.I.E.L.D., even though Coulson was personally given control of S.H.I.E.L.D. by Nick Fury. So the question of, well, why do these guys not acknowledge Coulson as the rightful leader of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Well, I imagine we're going to find that out next episode. Uh, speaking of Bobby, we also get to see that um, she's not doing such a great job of lying to Coulson. Uh, Coulson very clearly is picking up that something's not right here. But he's got bigger fish to fry at the moment, so he has to let this whole thing with Hunter and Bobby s slide. And of course that whole thing is um, Mr. Hyde, and that, that remember that's Cal's comic book counterpart, he has assembled his own little group of you know, villains to help him out. Um, now he, he, I love that start where he says like Team Shield versus Team whatever he mumbles, some ridiculous thing that he made up on the spot. Just for fun, I'm going to call these guys the Masters of Evil. Uh, we also do get to see um, Cal mention that, yeah, I experimented on myself with a serum that kind of gave me all this enhanced strength but made me volatile, which is, again, in keeping with um, the, or the story of Mr. Hyde in the comics. Uh, and the woman he recruits, uh, Carol or Carla, whatever, uh, in the Daredevil comics, she was actually a woman who uh, was trying to protect her abusive husband. And they did make a, have a quick line about her having an abusive boyfriend in the past, and that was the reason that she put those talons on her fingers. Uh, in the comics, that lady did not have any powers at all. But, you know, we have a minor character from the Daredevil comics, and Mr. Hyde did, if I remember correctly, originate as a Daredevil villain. And, of course, it's not going to be that long until Daredevil hits Netflix, so um, a little bit of savvy marketing on Marvel's part, I suppose, is a good way to put it. Um, now, the other two characters we have here. There's the guy, Francis, who uh, some people were speculating might have been the character of Ajax from the Deadpool comics. Uh, but apart from being named Francis, these guys really didn't have uh, much in common, and it's uh, since been revealed that, um, no, these are two completely different characters. Uh, as far as I can tell, this guy does not have any counterpart in the comics. Now, someone who did have uh, a counterpart in the comics was um, Angar, or I, I can't remember what his given name was, but his counterpart in the comics was, and I kid you not, this was the guy's name, Angar the Screamer, whose thing was more like a psychic, he could scream and people would have psychedelic visions. Uh, it might not surprise you to learn that a Angar was a product of the early 1970s. And, um, yeah, if you've ever seen a picture of this guy's counterpart in the comics, he looks ridiculously early 1970s. <laughs> um, the, the only, I mean, he's one of those characters that was really just like, just did not age well and was just kind of a dumb idea even at the time. In fact, the only real use that I've, I've ever seen Anger the Screamer have as a character was that he was the partner of a character with, um, a sonic scream called Screaming Mimi, who would later go on to be an extremely important character in the um, Kurt Busiek uh, Thunderbolts comics from the late 90s, which were really, really good. Uh, th again, Thunderbolts was, was awesome stuff back in the day. And uh, over the years, they really did a, a great job of fleshing out uh, Mimi as a character and really taking her on this amazing journey. And she's kind of fallen off the radar in the comics for the last several years, so I, I kind of would hope that they would dust her off again, again sometime soon. Because, again, they did a lot of really great stuff with those uh, characters in Thunderbolts. Uh, in fact, that's basically the kind of the series that really... Made, made Baron Zemo um, a character that a, a character that became a fan favorite in terms of villains in the Marvel universe.
that's where, and I've been around long before then, of course, but it was really that Thunderbolt series in the late nineties where fans really took a liking to the guy. And he's been much more high profile in the Marvel universe ever since then. And of course this kind of fits into, again, rumors about Captain America three with um, the idea that Baron Zemo may play a very significant role in that film. But again, this is all just rumors. Uh, so let's see. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> Cal takes his Masters of Evil to try and start, uh, you know, screwing with Coulson uh, by attacking the high school where Coulson's father worked. Now, actually, in the comics, it's established that uh, Coulson, or at least the, the comic book Marvel Universe equivalent of counterpart of Coulson, uh, grew up in Ohio. And here this episode takes place in Wisconsin. Now, Coulson says that his father had worked at that high school. So not that he went there, but just that his father had worked there. But still, I kind of get the, the the idea that it's going to end up being um, Marvel Cinematic Universe Coulson is from Wisconsin. Marvel Comics Coulson is from Ohio. Okay. I can live with little differences like that. I mean, at the end of the day, again, it's details, details. So, um, let's see. I, I absolutely loved uh, Team Shield squaring off against the Masters of Evil on the football field. I mean, super villains and superheroes throwing down like that in a stadium, in a staged, you know, contest. It's been done many times before. Uh, there was a really great episode of Justice League cartoon where they, they did that. And and I remember the Teen Titans comics uh, also had an event that was similar, where basically the exact same thing happened. Um, it's an oddly very DC kind of thing, but here it's here are the Mar it's the Marvel guys doing it. And yes, it's cheesy as all hell, but it's so much fun. I mean, comic books are always especially superhero stories, have always been kind of cheesy and over-the-top and more than a little ridiculous. But that's part of why they're fun. I mean, really, literally having good guys and bad guys stand on one end of opposite ends of a football field then run at each other and start beating the hell out of each other? Well, of course things like that would never happen in the real world. But because they can happen in comic books, that's why it's fun. And again, it's just so silly. I mean, it's just perfect for movies and TV and comic books. Again, it has no place in reality, but that's why it's fun. And, uh, of course, ultimately, Team Coulson manages to emerge victorious, which was very cool. You know, it's it's always good to see the, the good guys get wins like that. Uh, but we do get to see... Um, the, the inhuman guy, who I think has just been referred to as Lincoln, I don't think he's been officially been given a, like a code name or whatever, uh, pops up and grabs Cal and drags off and says, like, hey, you're making too much noise. Basically saying, like, hey, you're attracting a lot of attention to us in humans, and we can't have that. And this feeds back into what um, Simmons says to Coulson about how, like, okay, we the old classifications aren't going to work. We're going to need to deal with people like Cal, Cal who's you know, enhance themselves through science as, as some as enhanced, and then there are the people like Sky who are just born with this sort of thing that we don't really have a proper name for. And of course, Simmons has already previously thrown around the word inhuman, which honestly seems like kind of a dickish label to slap on someone, particularly your friend. But um, Marvel is officially unable to use the word mutant because Fox. Um, has the rights to all things X-Men currently. Now, there's the idea that somewhere down the road, I think there was a deal struck or, or something, they're, they're working on it, the idea that they might someday be able to bring the X-Men and mutants into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And despite some of the things that people from Marvel have said, it really does look like they're kind of using, going to be using Inhumans as a stand-in for mutants until that day happens, if it ever does. And you know what? I'm I'm okay with that. the The idea of people who are just born with this potential within them and to get superpowers is very much ingrained in the Marvel universe. So if you can't have mutants, well, Inhumans are the next logical choice. So I'm fine with that. 
And, um, yeah, I think that covers everything that I had to say about this episode. Again, not the most exciting one in the history of the series, but certainly a solid and enjoyable episode. So with that said, folks, we're going to call it here. As always, please comment, rate, and subscribe. And, of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Hoosier Jedi. Till next time, take care and have a good one.